Hello? Who is this? It's Jess. Ah, uh, Miss Bradford. This is Sergeant Nash. Are you the only one in the house? No. Phil and Barb are upstairs asleep. Why? All right. Now I want you to do exactly what I tell you without asking any questions, okay? But... No. No questions. Now just put the phone back on the hook, walk to the front door, and leave the house. What's wrong? Please, Miss Bradford. Please just do as I tell you. Okay. I'll get Phil and Barb. No, don't do that, Jess. Jess, the caller is in the house. The calls are coming from the house. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing, informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. I think you mean scare along because it's Halloween again as our second annual round of Halloween episodes. I am the titular Cole in that, Cole Rolaine, and each episode of The Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. We are at episode 31 this time around, which is Erica's Choice. Erica, what do you have in store for us? I chose for the first entry in Halloween, Black Christmas from 1974, directed by Bob Clark, written by Roy Moore, and starring Olivia Hussey, Keir DeLay, Margot Kidder, Andrea Martin, Art Hindle, John Saxon, Marion Waldman, and Doug McGrath. And it's the story of a group of sorority girls who are stalked by a stranger during their Christmas break. Now, I am pretty excited about this episode. Clearly. If everyone could see your face, they would know. Like a madman? Do you want to know why I am so excited? I would love to know why. I've prepared a little song. Have you prepared the song because you were so excited, or are you so excited because you've prepared a song? Gosh, I'm going to have to parse that sentence. Let's just let go of that question and get right into this great song that I made up. Okay. It is to the tune of Last Christmas by Wham. Okay. Your favorite song? Second favorite. Okay, sorry about that. My favorite song is actually one you also wrote just days ago, your vacuuming the house in your underwear song to the tune of Living After Midnight by Judas Priest. Here's how it goes. I didn't say sing it. (laughs) That is donor content only. Okay. Anyway, let me just warm up my instrument for a moment. Black Christmas, I gave you my heart, but the very next day you killed my roommate. This year, to save me from tears, don't put that bag over my head. What do you think? That's all I've got so far. How many keys? Except for, my God, I thought you were someone to rely on. But Agnes, what have you done with the baby? <laughs> and how many key changes were in that song just then? Uh, excuse me, Bob Dylan. <laughs> Why don't you tell me if you're so smart about it's that? It's a bold move to do it mid-verse, I gotta say. I just I just go where the muse takes me. And evidently the muse takes me, what, C to A to E. I'm just making up letters here. I don't actually know. I am also very excited about talking about this movie simply for the fact that it is a sheer delight. Is this one that you think non-horror fans know? Or do you think this exists still mostly in the cult film realm? You know, I came to this one pretty late in life. I hadn't heard about it when I was a young person. It wasn't a big star in my family or in my circle of friends. So I guess just on that kind of limited sample, I would say it has a great reputation, but probably a smaller reputation. Mm. And let's get right to the film. Okay. So we open first with the credits over a chorus singing Silent Night, of course, not obviously as well as I just did my song, (laughs) but it sounds pretty good. And it's a shot of the sorority house that is decorated for Christmas. Featuring the house, 
so prominently is significant, I think, because the house functions as a character in this as much as any of the players. There's a feeling of warmth and coziness that the house conveys that is important because that feeling is soon to be subverted almost immediately by the point of view entry from the killer. We start to meet our characters. We see Olivia Hussey go into the house first. She is playing Jess. And as you mentioned, we have that killer POV, which is really important and sets the tone for a lot of the film. We next see Margot Kidder, and she is coming down the stairs and realizes that the front door was left open. The movie wastes no time in establishing tone and getting a sense of character across as... America's sweetheart, Margot Kidder, says, who left the goddamn front door open? Margot Kidder as Barb, she is definitely the brassy, vulgar, as you mentioned, loud, louche character. She's a jerk. She is a jerk, yes. Now, one thing I didn't mention, actually, is that the film starts at night, which I think is interesting because I think back to the bigger, more popular scary movies that I've seen, and they typically start out in the daytime because we're establishing a sense of comfort and complacency and all is well, only to have that subverted, whereas this starts at night. And this is what I'm talking about with the house standing in as a character and offering that homey, secure feel. That takes the place of establishing safety in the daytime. And also, you would assume that you're safe during Christmas. That's the holiday that suggests fellowship and caring and family. Yes, this film is a subversion of a lot of those ideals. The Christmas holiday, the sanctity of home, the ideal of womanhood that is the sorority girl. We'll talk about all these in more detail as we go along. It affects me a little differently, though, because... The thing that sticks with me from this movie is how ultimately cold I feel all the time. It makes me feel cold in my bones. It's a combination of the weather and the stillness. And when you're inside the house, there's a beautiful bit of sound design where a lot of the time all you hear is the creakiness of a house that's that age and wind as if it's extremely drafty. So for me, it works a little bit the opposite in terms of how it's attempting to set up comfort and the warmth of hearth and home, I immediately feel chilled to the bone, and not in a surface way, but deep in my body. I agree with you, and I think that that's borne out by the fact that many of their shooting days were in temperatures well below freezing. As evidenced by Art Hindle's sweet coat. That was his coat as well. Still has it. Still has it. From what I understand. Big old beaver coat, full length, that he's wearing. Not a fur coat that you would see a society matron wearing. I mean, it's just a great big old, looks like it came off the skin and he slapped it right on his back. Yeah. It is a very Canadian coat. And this is maybe the most Canadian of all horror films, as far as I'm concerned. Did you notice a lot of that as we were watching? Very much, even though much later in the police station scene, they have one little American flag sitting on a desk to try to make us think (laughs) it's not from Canada. You're not fooling anybody, Canada. Now, at this point, we alternate between scenes from the holiday party going on inside the sorority house to the killer POV again. He is climbing up the trellis of the side of the house in order to get inside. And we clearly see a man's hands. Mm -hmm. You know, in another movie, the identity might be in question. You might think it's one of the sorority girls also killing everyone off. But it's clearly established this is a man. So this outside element coming into the house. And speaking of Canada, we see Andrea Martin. She is playing Phil in this with her boyfriend who looks like Jean Shallot possibly older. Everyone in this movie is well past uh, college age. Yes, that thing about pace that I mentioned, how it doesn't waste time setting up character points and plot points. Within a matter of about three minutes, the killer is in the house, already in the attic. And that attic is something to behold. It is festooned with nightmare knickknacks. 
from stem to stern, broken dolls and carousels. And... There's always going to be an empty bird cage. <laughs> There's always going to be a mannequin. Yeah. And not only those nightmarish things, but did you notice the Christmas tree itself downstairs behind Olivia Hussey at this point? Only in that it's very decorated, very garishly decorated. It's brightly colored from the lights mm -hmm. and all, but it appears to be covered in spider webs. Oh, okay. Almost. No, there I is so much that. garland or tinsel or whatever is on it. It looks like. Thousands of spiders are going to burst forth from it at any second. It's the creepiest Christmas tree I think I've seen in a long time. Maybe they flocked it, too. Who knows? If they flocked it with spider webs. Maybe. Who knows what they do in Canada? I don't know. <laughs> and as you mentioned as well, we get a sense of the characters right away, who they are. Very simple statements that they make put us in the position to understand who they are. Barb, for example, receives a call from her mother and calls her a gold-plated whore. She's clearly hurt. She was making some holiday plans, and her mother has completely destroyed those. Due to her own self-interest is what I think you get the sense of. I do. And one of the really interesting things about this very small scene and about how well this movie is made, just from that little exchange, I glean the fact that not only is their relationship not great, but it's because they're very much alike. You don't even hear or see her mother. You only see Margot Kidder's reaction to what's coming from the other end of the telephone. But I'm left with a very clear thumbnail sketch of what their relationship must be like, what the pitfalls of it are, and what those stem from, which is an impressive bit of acting and writing to shoehorn into about a 40 second scene that you only hear one side of the conversation. And we'll definitely hear Barb act out in more ways throughout the movie mm -hmm. as well. But for now, we're getting a sense of everyone. And Barb then decides to invite her friends along for these holiday plans. And we see her invite Claire, who seems like the country mouse in the story. She is more of the staid character. She's got the skirt that goes all the way down to the floor. She's dressed more conservatively. She wears her hair more conservatively. And she says, oh, no thanks, Barb, I've got other plans. Claire is the virginal one of the group. And the way slasher films were made in their heyday, which was just a few years after this, she would likely have been the final girl based on the morality of the characters in this group. Let's put that in a little bit more context. So I want to mention again, this is 1974. Halloween is 1978. Mm -hmm. Friday the 13th. 1980. So as you mentioned, what would come a few years later and more establish the elements of the genre? Black Christmas in particular is extremely interesting in terms of the establishment of these genre tropes, both in terms of the genre elements that consistently continue to appear and the ones that were jettisoned after this. Now, one element that I think of as a hallmark of great filmmaking in general is a compelling sound design. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about how the killer is already in the house. We first started to hear him breathe a few moments ago, which to me is quite unsettling. And it's here where the second phone call arrives. This is though the first time we as the audience will meet the moaner as the sorority girls call him. And this is where the soundscape really begins to come into play. Let me say first, before I talk about what actually happens in the call, these phone calls from this killer are what held me back from watching this movie <laughs> in the first place you knew for about years. Them? You were aware of their existence I had heard, before you yes, watched? Yes, I'd heard one part it was so unsettling. I know I've said that word, and I'll probably say it again. It was so unsettling. I held this movie at arm's length. And I was completely correct to do so, because <laughs> they are terrifying. Now, let's talk about, specifically, the call itself. Talk about soundscape. It is a combination of bizarre, otherworldly sounds with very much real sounds like grunts and squeals and screams, and laughs, and snorts. Multiple voices, it seems like. Because one of the girls specifically asks, can that be one person? Or at least a voice pitched in different directions to be like other people having a conversation 
together. And the language itself, which we won't go into here, is very disturbing. It's the worst of the worst for a lot of people. Very blunt. Yes, it is. And it's not just disturbing because it's a man directed at women. I think if anybody got this phone call, they would be pretty unsettled. Although there is an implied sexual violence. There is. You are absolutely correct. Now, Barb, in her spectacular manner, gives him what for, basically. He ends his part of the call by saying, I'm going to kill you. Flatly. It's a complete change from everything that happened up until that point. It's very matter-of-fact. It's very quiet. It's very determined. Now, I once got an obscene phone call. Just once? Just once. Do mine not count? No. <laughs> okay. Yours are fun. And this was the most benign obscene phone call ever. It was some telemarketer. And I basically said, <laughs> no, thank you. And he said, you sound nice. <laughs> And I said, no, thank you again, and hung up the phone. That was my one obscene phone call. It was a telemarketer? It was a telemarketer. I think he was just bored, I guess. How do you know that's what it was? Did he do a pitch? Yeah, yeah it started with, then this is went into MCI, we want you to change. MCI. And I don't, that's, I'm putting you in the time period okay. for when Thanks. I received it. <laughs> Have you received your America Online disc? You sound nice. No, thank you. Click. And you say this is the first time that the audience hears their interaction with this character that they know as the moaner. This very first phone call is really pivotal for me because this is the first time in the film that I become aware of the story of these characters in either direction from the body of the film itself. What happened prior to the start of the film and what happens when the credits roll. Because in my head, partly based on this phone call, I have invented an elaborate backstory and an extension of the film beyond the end that makes me wonder, is this the killer? Because the tone of the calls after this, you could say it's an increase in the intensity of them, but to me they feel different from this very first one. To me it seems like, yes, this may be a completely separate and coincidental obscene phone caller, this very first one, from the calls that come later, that are coming from inside the house that are coming from the killer. It makes me wonder specifically about the killer's backstory. There's an episode in the middle of the film about another murder that takes place that makes me wonder about the chronology of all of these events. And I'm left wondering at this point if it's two different callers. And it's an idea that suits the film a great deal because one of the real strengths of Bob Clark's presentation here that makes this as timeless as it is is the ambiguity of so much of it. He never specifically spells out resolution, origin, any of those things, and leaves so much to the imagination that you can project all of these questions and theories onto it. And it's relevant because we don't know the answer. We do not learn the answer to your question. And within simply the logistics of the film, we have seen the man whom we come to know as the killer go into the attic, is there supposed to be a phone in the attic? That would be kind of odd. So it could easily be another person, which just means, gosh, there is a lot of terror starting to happen. Right. And the terror that's beginning to unfold that you mentioned happens in such a way in this small, fairly contained environment. It's managed by the killer in the film and Bob Clark as the director of the film in such a way that... For the most part, it makes a fair amount of sense. Everyone's reaction to what they think is a missing girl, not a dead girl, and the disappearance of the house mother, which is easily explained by the fact that everyone is leaving for the holiday. But before we get too far afield, back to this phone call. Like we mentioned, it introduces the specter of violence, particularly sexual violence directed at these girls assembled in the house. But at the moment... They take it purely for an obscene call, which people get. It's not that out of the ordinary. They're a little frightened by it, but they're as much entertained as they are frightened, it seems like. Now, another element of this terror that's being slowly brought into the story, we learn in the next breath, really, that a town girl was recently raped. And then Barb says something really pretty offensive right here. She says, you can't rape a townie. 
So as crude as that is, I think it shows again that people aren't reacting with undue fright here. These are, at this moment, unassociated events. No one's reacting with major alarm here. Now, everyone tries to just keep going on about their business. Jess tries to be a peacemaker because Claire is offended by that statement. Claire is going to get packed to go away. Isn't she, though? <laughs> Did you notice? She's got that full-size poster of her boyfriend, Art Hendel. I did notice. Was that a thing that people did? I've never seen a full-size poster of a person that I know in somebody else's Well, he was house. a hockey player, right? So maybe that had something to do with okay. it. Okay. Anyway, sorry. And we see the killer in Claire's closet behind some plastic. This is how Claire is murdered. The killer wraps the plastic around her face to suffocate her and... There's so much noise here, but it's interesting, I think, and we will see this repeated with the other kills in the film. What we actually see on screen is not that much. It's more implied. And then we see her body afterwards. And it was obviously a very violent act, but we don't see all the violence as the audience. No, we see the staging of the bodies for very specific effect. It's one of those things that makes me endlessly curious about the killer's pathology because he uses them as props in this tableau that he's building as the movie goes along. I also think this is the element that makes the film so rewatchable is to come back and take your expectation and then see what the reality is. Mm -hmm. That ambiguity that I mentioned, which is a real strong suit for the greatest horror films of all time, the things you think you saw, for example, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where you see very little actual bloodshed. The shower scene from Psycho, where you see only a few drops in the bottom of the shower, but in your mind it's amplified so much by how well it's designed and what it sounds like, and therefore the way you remember it, it looms much larger in your imagination. This first kill is also significant for me in that... The film is so well made in terms of its tension and release and its pace and just its general artistry that this doesn't feel like formula. We mentioned how it establishes certain genre tropes, but when you're the pioneer, when you're the first one, sometimes it's hard to look back and separate that from everything that came after, but this definitely feels different. It does not feel like it is setting up a mousetrap game a series of unlikable teens that are just cannon fodder. This feels a little personal, because I like Claire immediately. I think each character has their own set of stakes, mm -hmm. whatever it is in their life, and we see that. We understand what it is for each person. All of the slashers that came in this one's wake would have done well to take up this lesson of making your characters actual real people. Whether that be likable or unlikable. Like Margot Kidder. Right. Or more complicated, like Jess. Jess, we learn, has some very serious stakes mm -hmm. in this story. Right after we have the first kill, we meet the house mother, Mrs. Mack. Mm -hmm. The old foul-mouthed granny. She's a drunk as well. She's got some stakes in this. Who has the sherry concession is what I want to know, because that guy is a rich man. There's a bottle in the library. There's a bottle in the toilet tank. It seems like there's one stored in every nook and cranny that she thinks the girls won't look in. To get us back to Jess for a second, we have yet another phone call, which the second the phone rings, I'm on edge again. I don't know about you. But this time, it's for Jess. She says, we've got to find some time to talk. It's her boyfriend, Peter. Now, Jess goes upstairs, knocks on Claire's door. No one answers because Claire did. And then we see her upstairs in the attic in a rocking chair with that plastic over her head, her mouth open, and an adult, the killer, is singing, humming, a nursery rhyme, a song of some kind. And now it is the next day. It is daylight again. We see an older man waiting at a clock tower. He gets hit by a snowball. He's asking the young man who goes by if he happens to know Claire. 
and gets directions to where she lives. Oh, they're in our sister house, eh? Yeah. <laughs> the most Canadian directions he can get. Sorry. <laughs> Don't you mean sorry? <laughs> <laughs> Now, back at the house, the sorority is hosting a children's party, which seems wildly inappropriate. <laughs> at least if Margot Kidder is there. Yeah, which she is, and she's giving alcohol to a little boy. And Gene Shallot, Andrea Martin's boyfriend, is dressed up as Santa. He's cursing all over the place. With a child on his lap. So it's pretty wild and wooly over there. It was 1974. Things were a little different. They were. And we see that in Claire's bedroom. We learn that this man that we saw waiting at the clock tower is Claire's father. So he goes to her room to try to determine why she wasn't there waiting for him. And Dad's disapproving glance takes in the pictures of an old lady giving the finger, some naked people making a peace sign, the full length of Art Hendel. And he says he's very disappointed in the atmosphere. This is one of those moments of levity that break up the tension very necessarily, I think. Bob Clark is extremely underrated, in my opinion, especially as a genre filmmaker. In addition to this, in the early 70s, children shouldn't play with dead things, death dream. The guy made a handful of horror films that are still significant, in addition to making A Christmas Story which everyone on Earth has seen five million times around the holiday season at this point. But his contribution to the horror genre, I think, goes overlooked a lot of the time, especially next to, say, Cronenberg, who was probably the most prominent Canadian horror filmmaker. Bob Clark's contributions to the genre should not be overlooked. So this moment of levity here feels correct to you. It doesn't feel misplaced. No, there's a real sense of tension and release to the thing. I don't think it ever goes as far as, say, your Charles B. Pierce interjections of humor into things like The Town That Dreaded Sundown, which is alternately terrifying and then intercut with Dukes of Hazard style car chases. And I'm going to bring up that again later on. There's a specific character who reminds me of what he did in The Town That Dreaded Sundown. It never goes that far, though. What's so disturbing here that we close on the image of Claire essentially looking down at them from the attic window. Mm -hmm. But they never look up high enough, or there would probably be a glare, so no one can actually see her, but she's right there. It's something that really hits me in the closing credits, the image of her in that window. And again, makes me feel cold and abandoned and alone all over again. When the camera pulls back at the very end, and you see the police officer standing on the stoop, and it reveals Claire up in the window... She feels very much like the killer wanted it to feel, I think, as if she is just one more of the house decorations. Now we make an interesting transition here, another window transition, and we see Jess telling her boyfriend Peter, who is played by Cure Delay, that she's pregnant. And very matter-of-factly, she doesn't want it. She wants to get an abortion. And economy a script in this again, there's no big rigmarole. We aren't led through a series of events before this. She just tells us this right away. Mm -hmm. And we have to note here that Roe v. Wade was 1973, so the year before this came out. It's one of the real strong suits of the film in that the subject matter is very adult. It's mature subject matter. It's not just the concerns of vacuous kids. There are grim overtones appropriate to a horror film, but... The struggles that these characters are going through are much more than, what are we going to do next weekend? There's abortion, feminism in general, alcoholism as a subtext. There's a lot more going on here than in your average slasher film that would come 10 years down the road. And as an audience member now, it is still quite startling to me to watch this conversation play out because so often in films today we still dance around mm -hmm. the topic. Or there's got to be some sort of an explanation as to why a woman wants to have an abortion other than she just doesn't want to have the baby. It's a pretty big deal. And we've been talking about stakes. I think the unspoken part of that, which we will get into a bit later, is that 
I think she also doesn't want Peter anymore. He's more invested in this relationship than she is. And he insists that she cannot make this decision on her own. In fact, tells her she will be sorry. He's involved in this major moment in his life and career. He's about to have this big recital that he's been working on for eight years at this point. So he's in the middle of this. He insists that they continue to talk about it. There are a lot of things that were built in, but maybe not talked about as much in 1974, but that I think everyone carried an innate knowledge of within themselves that we now, in 2016, have more statistics to bear out to point specifically to why this feels this way. Why, for example, Peter is such an apt red herring when he makes this vaguely threatening comment about you'll be sorry if you don't keep this baby. The statistics tell us, obviously, violence against women, particularly fatal violence, comes a staggering amount more from people you know versus a stranger. You stand a much better chance of being killed by Peter than you do by some lunatic breaking into the attic of your house. A study from 2013, for example, in the United States, just over 1,600 women were murdered. Of those 1,600 women, 94% was someone they knew. 62% were wives or intimate partners of the person that killed them. So this feeling that Peter is capable of doing these terrible things that we see unfold, specifically to Jess because of his anger about this situation, I think that's a knowledge that is at least innate if we don't say it out loud. And the other part of this threat, if you don't take it as a threat of violence, is equally troubling in that it's, I'm going to essentially force you to marry me and have my child. And it's the death of her dreams. So certainly that's less terrifying than murder. Mm -hmm. But again, very high stakes. And as the film often does, we move immediately from that scene Back to the house, we've got Mr. Harrison, who's Claire's father, on the phone trying to figure out what has happened to her. Barb is drunk. We get another phone call. This is Jess answering again. This is when we hear the name Billy. And Agnes. And there's a suggestion of what your mother and I must know is, where did you put the baby? Hmm. So we start to talk about a baby. Jess hangs up on him mid-rant with this. Now, a small group of them, Barb, Phil, and Mr. Harrison, they head to the police station. We also see Peter at his recital. He is clearly cracking up. It is not going well. We get back to the police station, and separately, there's a local mother who is in the station to report that her young daughter has not yet come home, and it's been hours. Adding to the mounting tension and layer upon layer of odd, unsettling circumstances. Though yet no one is in full alarm mode. They're concerned. They're getting there. They're getting there. The police haven't yet gotten there. We meet John Saxon. He is the first person that seems to be at least taking this seriously, so let's go do some investigation about this. Back at the house again, the group that's left there, Mr. Harrison, Barb, Phil, and Mrs. Mack, they're eating. Barb is drunk again, being shocking again. She does recognize some of her own pathology and she accuses the others of blaming her blaming barb for driving claire away because they don't know what's happened to her she's very combative she's very angry phil tells her you're drunk go to bed at which point we know she's done for she's obviously not the main protagonist and anytime you are culled from the herd that's it her murder I want to specifically point out, though, again, defying the genre tropes that come later, I don't think happens because of what she represents. She's not being punished for being sexual, for being a drunk, for being crude, for being any of these things. I don't think anyone in particular is singled out for their behavior and punished accordingly. That does not feel like what these kills are all about. I really don't like this character, but... It's not for any of those things that I just mentioned either. The thing that I find most distasteful is the intentional shock. I don't care what she drinks. I don't care who she has sex with. I don't care what crude things she says. 
except for the fact that it is all manufactured for effect. It is all to get a rise out of whoever she perceives her audience to be. And that is a character I never want to be around. I'm not saying I'm glad she's dead. (laughs) But I am saying I'm glad I don't have to deal with her for the final 30 minutes of the movie. Before that happens, though, we have even more violence. We see Peter destroying his piano because his recital went so terribly. He should have wrecked that plaid jacket he was wearing. No kidding. Or his dry look haircut. (laughs) Not a beautiful piano. That was the sports jacket equivalent of an Andy's Mint. A plaid Andy's Mint is what that was. I like Andy's Mints. You want to wear one? No. Well, (laughs) could I eat it off of? Could I have a glove? Did you see it? It was made of the scratchiest wool you can imagine. Definitely. While this is all happening, we have the local volunteer search party forming at a lake park area to begin to search for the young girl who has not come home yet, Janice, and also for Claire. Again, though, back at the house, Mrs. Mack is preparing to go away to visit her sister. She's packing her vaudevillian steamer trunk full of sherry. I'm assuming also a red tam shanter maybe. (laughs) Her taxi is honking for her. She is now trying to find Claude, the house cat. She hears something overhead. She goes to investigate the attic. And sorry, it is goodbye, Mrs. Mack. The last of the last of the Red Hot Mamas. Good one. (laughs) House mother Jim Leahy is dead. (laughs) Bringing it all back to Canada. That tickled me so much I laughed until I started coughing and you had to pause it. <laughs> Again, a pretty vicious kill that we don't completely see, but the suggestion of is pretty terrible. She is killed with a giant hook, kind of like a Apollo. Block and tackle hook. I was thinking uh, the Apollo Theater, where they bring the big hook to pull you off the stage almost. That's what it makes me think of. When have you ever seen anyone's head smashed in on the Apollo? Um... <laughs> An evening at the Apollo. I guess maybe that's Midnight at the Apollo I'm thinking of. No, I think of, again, her vaudevillian stuff, and it seems kind of appropriate that a giant hook does her in. And then in his frenzy, post-kill, as often happens, Billy, which is how we know this character at this point, trashes the attic. And I think that this is, again, a lot more about what we hear rather Mm -hmm. than what we see. We meet back up with Jess again. She is leaving the search party to go to her meeting with Peter at the house. We see that frozen moment again. Now it's Claire and Mrs. Mack in the attic. Back to the search party, they find something. I love this town because it is full of creeps and weirdos. Not just the killer. All of these guys who are coming around to help, knocking on the door of the sorority house, standing around taking part in the search party. In this scene, as they find the girl in the park, Janice, there is what appears to be Roman Polanski in a fake mustache around a fire in a barrel. I missed that guy. Watch we'll go it back again. and freeze frame that so you can see what I'm talking about. But not who you want hanging around looking for missing young girls. That makes you think of all of those reports saying the killer always comes back to the scene of the crime. <laughs> Just, yeah, maybe it's any of these 20 guys. We're making jokes, but there is sadness everywhere. Again, it's a very grim tone. It's nighttime at this point, again. Nothing could be colder, nothing could be lonelier or more desolate than this stark midwinter cold scape. And that scene ends with a shot of the face of the mother as she comes upon the grisly discovery. She's screaming, and that scream becomes the ringing of the phone back at the house. Another terrible phone call. It's grunting and crying, and Billy says, Stop Me, which was the original Mm -hmm. title of the film. And Jess is the one who has answered, and he says, I know what you did. She hangs up again. She calls out for Mrs. Mack. We know Mrs. Mack is dead. No one's going to return her shout. We see from time to time, and in this moment as well, a distant shadow upstairs. Jess goes to make another call. The camera pans behind her, and we see a shadow on the stairs, which becomes feet. 
And there's a little bit of a jump scare here because it's Peter putting his hand on her shoulder. Peter asks, what was all the yelling about? Which makes us think, okay, Peter is not the person making the calls. Also, with the proximity, how could he have made a call, hung up the phone, run down the stairs without her hearing all of this? Cutting back and forth between Jess and Peter's conversation, we have Jess attempting to report these obscene phone calls. Unfortunately, she gets Sergeant Nash on the phone, who was the least helpful policeman ever. Who volunteers? There's been a child murdered in the park. Yes, yeah, so we're really busy with that. These things can't possibly be connected. To a citizen. Just gives up that piece of information. That's true. A crucial piece of an ongoing investigation. It was 1974. Mm. Now, the other friends of Claire, the other members of the family, have come back into the station, and they all notice that the address that Jess is reporting that these calls are coming from, that's also where Claire lives. So trying to make everyone see that those pieces are connected. Peter, in the meantime, announces essentially that he's leaving the conservatory and that they are getting married. To which she says, hold on a minute. That is not part of my plan. That was not part of your plan. So why, if you are now changing yours, am I obligated to change mine? I am not, and so therefore I will not. He calls her a selfish bitch. And there's that looming threat again, if you try to get an abortion. She tells him to leave. And as he's leaving, the lieutenant and the others come into the house at the same time. And you can see John Saxon, the lieutenant, giving him a pretty appraising look. And the lieutenant has brought in my very favorite character, Graham from the phone company. Because you know I love process. Mm -hmm. I love the part where they're getting down to work to see what's happening. And this guy is a very recognizable actor. He is the Christmas tree salesman in A Christmas Story. Mm -hmm. So we now know that the phone company is going to attempt to trace these obscene phone calls. And we're still not clear at this point how many people are making these calls, if it's a man and a woman at the same time, or what exactly is going on. They're also trying to provide some background to the lieutenant about Claire, that she really has no enemies. She doesn't have a lot of boyfriends. We jump back and forth between that and Graham attaching the trace to the phone. We hear some of that wonderful and crazy incidental music in that specific scene as well. And the composer created it with forks and combs and knives, and he tied it to the strings of his piano. Right, prepared piano. Very avant-garde. Very John Cage. And he would also put pressure on the reels of his recorder to make it go more slowly. Pretty crazy. It really interesting and really effective. We now get introduced to my second favorite character, which is the switching station. The switching station itself. Yes, I love it. I want to hang out in there. Now, to those who didn't grow up in the era of rotary phones... Mm -hmm or never saw anything like that on TV, the process to do this tracing is hugely complicated, but that switching station is cool. The locations in the film are so great about setting up a specific feeling of time and place, some of which, like you mentioned, is archaic, outdated, no longer relevant to anyone coming to the film as a young person now. But I can't see how you can see that switching station and not find it at least as compelling as the CSI idea of cell phone triangulation. Because in this, a person has to physically move through a building and track signal after signal. It's a race against time. It is. And the specific piece of importance to the story is that whomever is on these calls, Jess, for example has to keep the caller on the phone for a considerable length of time while this guy at the switching station runs through it to try to figure out where this call is coming from. So both the characters and the audience have to endure these lunatic rants for much longer than anyone should be subjected to, strictly because of the technology. We've got that established. Now Jess is just waiting. This is the particular moment that I relate to most in the whole movie. This slightly tranquil period where nothing is happening, where she is sitting by the glow of the Christmas tree, just waiting for whatever's going to happen next. One of my favorite things to do ever since I was very little 
was to get up late at night on Christmas by myself and sit in our very cold house in the middle of winter with no sounds, sitting there by the Christmas tree. I felt like I was the last person on earth. And it was a strangely comforting feeling, but it very much contributes to this feeling that I mentioned from the outset of being cold and alone, and in the case of this film specifically, abandoned. I react very strongly to this scene in particular of her sitting there in what must now be the middle of the night, with no one around, no sound happening, just processing what has happened so far and considering what is to come. As Jess waits... As the lieutenant waits, there's nothing that they can particularly do right now. We hear someone gasping upstairs, and it's a bit of a blind because it's Barb, and she's having an asthma attack. Phil hears her and goes in to take her inhaler, and Barb says that she was having a nightmare of a stranger in her room. Phil settles her back in. Barb goes back to sleep. Downstairs, we hear carolers outside, and Jess opens the door to a young group of angelic youngsters singing Christmas carols. (laughs) She has to stand there and listen to them singing, staring at them while they stare back at her, and it just reinforces my statement from Top Hat that being sung to is the worst thing in the world. Would you classify caroling as worse because of the volume Is it worse than a suitor to be face-to-face with a dozen dead-eyed little Canadians? Well, they're singing these Christmas carols that have 40 verses. (laughs) It just goes on forever. (laughs) It's not a standard two-minute pop song from 1940. Do you think, though, seriously, though, do you think, is there something in this scene that's conveyed to you that maybe she is softening her stance on this baby thing? Is that a thought that's going through her mind? I don't think so. I think it's just a moment of Christmas cheer. If there had been a moment where she reaches out to one of them or does anything else other than just listen and it's cheerful, maybe, but I don't think so. I think she's resolute. It does double duty. In addition to being incredibly awkward, it also provides cover for Margot getting it with the old crystal unicorn. And that's not a euphemism. I thought actually you were going to say, before that it does double duty in that another parent comes up and tells the kids, get in the car and get out of here. Oh, that too. Triple duty. Triple trouble. I think actually it probably reinforces what she feels, just like any time I go to a department store and I or a grocery store and I remember why I don't have kids. <laughs> Anyway, sorry, Canadian parents. Back to Barb. Now, to me, when we see the figure of the killer in the scene, he has similar hair to Peter's. Did you notice that as well? Mm Mm-hmm. The dry look was big. It was. In 1974. It was. And he says, it's me, Billy. He's speaking to her before he dispatches her. She's asleep, and he wakes her up just before she gets the Hummel figurine in the bread basket. Where would the bread basket be in this scenario? The stomach. Oh, okay. Now, again, all of this is happening pretty simultaneously. Mm-hmm. We hear the phone ringing again, and this is going to be the first attempt to track it. So in this call, he's maybe crying. I'm not entirely sure. Or possibly there's a baby or a small child crying. And he screams just like having a wart removed, which is something that Peter had said to Jess earlier about her feelings, essentially, about getting rid of the baby. That's how he characterizes it. So he exhibits some inside knowledge that either Peter would have or someone that overheard that conversation would have. Again, Peter is a red herring. And this is so startling, she hangs up. So there wasn't enough time to trace the call. This, though, puts Peter on the radar of the police... Because Jess admits that, oh, what he said meant something to her and why it did. But she's reluctant to accuse Peter of anything at this point. There is a cop stationed out front, which should give you some sense of security. Shakira? Shakira. Shakira's out front. She's singing. We have another call again. This time it's Peter. Now, we know that everyone is listening in, everyone being police and the phone company as well. So... Jess has to specifically get into the fact that she's pregnant 
and doesn't want to have the baby with Peter. The lieutenant is pretty suspicious that Peter could possibly be involved somehow, so he's going to investigate Peter some more. Now, a lot of things start happening even more quickly at this point. There are a group of locals that are going around to warn everyone to lock their windows and doors. And Jess and Phil notice that only one area in the house is even locked at this point, so they set about to lock everything. Now, Phil knocks on Barb's door. She goes in. She's looking to the side as the door closes behind her. So we know Phil is done. And downstairs, Jess has just been talking to Phil. She goes to shout for her again and gets no answer. At that moment, the killer calls from the phone in Mrs. Mack's room. He's squealing and grunting. There's a second voice, it sounds like. And he says, you left Billy alone with Agnes. This is intercut with a lineman running through the switching station again, trying to trace this call. Which works this time. This is the first time that she's kept him on the line long enough for it to be successful. Graham gets that signal and calls it in. The lieutenant who is there on campus, he gets the radio call in the car. And it's he who learns that the calls are both going to and coming from the house. Now this springs from the old urban legend of the babysitter and the call coming from inside the house. Yes, the babysitter and the killer upstairs, also known as the babysitter, also known as the sitter, which I know I read when I was a kid. Now this is terrifying. Do we need to go into how terrifying it is that the killer is inside the house? How terrifying is it? <laughs> it is so terrifying. I probably peed my pants the first time I saw it. Didn't we see it together the first time? No. I saw it on my own, by myself, as I have done with many other things like this. Sitting in a room, cuddled up in a blanket, scared out of my mind, and checking all the doors and windows afterwards. Now, the lieutenant has to get help to Jess. He unfortunately entrusts Sergeant Nash to impart the information to Jess to get her out of the house. There's a cop there outside. We knew that already. Mm -hmm. But we see he has also been murdered. So until they can get there, they've got to get her out of the house as quickly as possible. And that's the scene that we did at the very beginning where he bungles it. He can't get her not to ask any questions. She can't stop herself from trying to call for Barb and Phil, possibly going upstairs. She doesn't walk right out the door. Do you? Is that another one of those tropes? Going back to look for your friends or not literally walking right out the door and saving yourself as quickly as possible? I would say so. Do you do that if you get that call? I'm sorry, babe. If I get that call, <laughs> I'm out the dough. But instead of leaving the house, she goes up to Barb's room to try to rouse her friends, whom she thinks are just fine and asleep, probably. Because, again, the series of events is a very short amount of time. She was just yelling for Phil a minute ago. She'd just seen her. They were just in the same room. But instead, she finds herself eye to eye with Billy. She comes into Barb's room, sees Barb and Phil staged in another one of these gruesome tableaus, and she hears a sound. She turns, sees Billy's wide-open eye staring out at her from the dark, and he speaks to her. The terror is at a fever pitch now. She slams the door on him and tries to run, ends up running down into the basement because the front door is locked and she cannot get it open, and manages to close that and lock it just before he gets there. And the foley work on him trying to get into this basement door is unreal. It sounds like the wrath of God on the other side of that door. It is so loud and insistent. It may be one of the scariest pieces of the sound design in the whole movie, even including the creepy phone calls, because it is so overwhelmingly loud and connotes such frenzy and brutality on the other side of the door that it is nothing you want to come face to face with. But just as abruptly, it stops. And we hear a voice outside, and we realize it's Peter. Who has been stalking the house periodically throughout the final act. He's asking if she's all right. She doesn't answer. He breaks a window and comes into the basement as she is still trying to stay in the shadows. He at last sees her 
and smiles. Now she's clutching the fireplace poker that she managed to grab before she headed down to the basement. At the same time, the police finally arrive. They see the dead cop. They hear Jess screaming and make it into the basement with guns drawn. They see almost another staging that we've seen before. Peter is draped over Jess. He's bloody. Eyes open. Eyes open. She's leaning back. We can't tell if they're both dead, but we realize as Jess begins to move, Peter is dead. Jess has killed him. The ambiguity of the film leads me right here to what I think may be the most interesting question of the whole thing. Do you think she knew it wasn't him and she killed him anyway? I say yes before you even answer. Okay. I specifically think she took this opportunity to rid herself of him and that specter of violence and or domesticity that he represented. She might not have been 100% sure either way, but I think she was definitely leaning towards he's not the killer. I think she knew in her heart that that was the truth and she did this thing anyway. So that's the case for the prosecution. Case for the defense could be she was in such shock and trauma and terror that she was simply defending herself against a force. Wink. (laughs) Again, we don't know the answer because we are hurtling towards the ending. Jess has been given a sedative and we've got these figures of authority and or comfort around her bed. There's Mr. Harrison. There are the cops. There's Chris. A doctor. They're talking about getting the bodies out of the house, which seems pretty cold-blooded in front of Mr. Harrison because he still doesn't know what's happened to his daughter. Pivotal, I think. At this point, they only realize it's Barb and Phil and Peter. And the cop outside. Right. When they say bodies, they are not referring to anything that's in the attic. They still have not gone up in the attic at this point. Now... One by one, they leave her in the room by herself, which seems like a terrible policy. Well, in their defense, they think Peter was the killer, and he's done. I would still put her in a hospital rather than leave her in the murder house. (laughs) But that's just me. There's your socialized medicine. Now, upstairs, we hear rocking and creaking and singing, and a door opens, and a voice says... Agnes, it's me, Billy. And that's when we close out on the image that you had mentioned earlier of there are two bodies still up there looking down out at us. There's a cop on the porch trying to stay warm. And Jess is the person left in the house on her own, still with the killer. Just prior to that, I really love that touch of how one by one they all leave her. You hear everything but the camera remains focused on her through the doorway and you see her slowly one at a time begin to be abandoned while you still get to hear their conversations about what has happened and what is going to happen. And the last thing we hear is the sound of the phone ringing. Okay. Now that we've come to the end of the film, why in particular did you choose this one for the show? I had a little list in my head of choices I could have made for this first Halloween entry this year. This I like so much. Going back to that idea we talked about of how violent is the actual film, your memory of it and the reality of it being possibly two different things. I think it asks so many interesting questions that it doesn't feel that it has to answer. Mm -hmm leaving so much to audience interpretation that it makes it an interesting rewatch. I think it takes on interesting issues, both of the time and of now. I think it looks great. It moves so quickly and in such an interesting way. Well edited, well directed, well acted. It's truly frightening. It's got great scares in it. And you know me, you've watched it with me. You've seen me jump at the same things after watching it uh, five times now. And it plays on real fears that will never go away. And I know once we finish this and I listen back to the episode, I'll come up with 10 other reasons that I'm not (laughs) thinking of right now. It's great. 
Now, I know you're a fan as well. Would you have chosen this? I would definitely have chosen this for an episode as well, for a number of reasons. My favorite being the ambiguity that you mentioned. It treats the audience with respect and assumes that you can paint in these spaces that are left wide open. I love the fact that the killer is not caught nor even identified. You don't see that with any of the franchises that follow. With each of those, there is an entire universe that's built and an immense backstory. In the case of Halloween, for instance, a mythology that gets incredibly convoluted and loses its way, whereas this self-contained, no sequel, a terrible remake, but no sequel, stretches out in my imagination in all directions. I think about these characters and what came before and what comes after when they leave her alone in that house. If, in fact, she did murder Peter, does she now go on to be this killer's partner because she has discovered this thing within her? Is there some understanding of him that she has now, if that is, in fact, what happened? There are so many potential paths for this to take and places for it to have come from. It's endlessly fascinating. In addition to that, there's the influence on the genre that is obviously inescapable. But the things that are most interesting about that to me are the things that this does well that were then not picked up by the other more pale imitations. The motivation for this being so insane and not basic revenge. It's not a body count movie. There's no supernatural element that provides too many easy loopholes in films that come later. There's not that wages of sin angle that we mentioned. I love the fact that this film tells you essentially you can take whatever your moral stance is and stick it. It has nothing to do with what is happening here. The good, the bad, the in-between, all are punished indiscriminately and randomly as happens in the world. The final girl is not the morally pure one. And we don't have that not quite dead, the killer's body was here, now it's gone, therefore sequel. We don't have any of those things that later cheapened the genre. I love the fact that this avoids all of that. Now that you say that, it crystallizes something I was thinking of. Okay. Which is that unknown factor. The unknown is always going to be the most frightening, even though, statistically, we know that actually it is the known that is quite often the most terrifying and violent, but not understanding or knowing or being told the pathology of something makes it this terrible cosmic joke that's being played on you that you didn't ask for, you didn't create, and didn't cause which I think goes back to what I was saying about it, playing on audience fears that don't go away. And in keeping with that moral ambivalence that I mentioned, I also love that it's not conservative in the way that most slasher films are. In other slashers, you have killer on the rampage, and then everything is set right again when that threat is neutralized, returning everything to a state of normalcy. Whereas in this you specifically do not have that conservative approach. There is no happy ending. There is no resolution whatsoever. There's only the looming threat of more violence. And it subverts a couple of very specific ideas. The feel-good holiday film, which this is the first seasonal slasher that came along. Yes, the first tie-in to a holiday. And it also exploits this idea of violence against a collective of women as a symbol rather than what could be written off as a personal attack violence against a single woman you have the sorority as a specific target paragons of virtue ideals of womanhood at least that's how they portray themselves that's what these sororal organizations aim for the thing that is specifically frightening about targeting the sorority is that your privilege will not help you. Even though you set yourselves above and apart, that means nothing at all. That is erased in the blink of an eye. And that, when it manifests itself in the real world, is beyond terrifying. Specifically, just a few years after this, in 1978, at Florida State University, Ted Bundy snuck into the Chi Omega house through an unlocked door or a door with a broken lock, much like This killer climbs up the trellis into the attic and killed two girls in the middle of the night. 
And this was going to be broadcast on network TV around the same time. Terrible timing, and it got pulled because of that. So with these specific targets, in this specific season, and the way it's presented, there's no safe place anywhere. There's no comfort of home. There's no safety in numbers. Everything about it is creepy and frightening. So I guess what I'm saying is uh, season's grievings. Good one. You gave me the perfect segue to my recommendation. Fancy that. What is your recommendation? It is Good Neighbors from 2010, another Canadian film. It was written and directed by Jacob Tierney, and it stars Jay Baruchel, Emily Hampshire, and Scott Speedman. And it is the story of tenants in a building in the Notre Dame de Grasse neighborhood who tried to determine who amongst them is a serial killer. Now, I was inspired by Canada, clearly, and I wanted to get something a little spooky. This isn't a horror film. It's actually got a lot of black comedy in it. What inspired me the most, though, is this idea of assumed relationships Mm. that are not real. Now, you have to see the film to understand what I mean specifically, so go out and watch it. And I say that specifically to you because you haven't seen it yet, correct? Correct. Well, hopefully we will watch it pretty soon. Now, how about your recommendation? My recommendation is from 1976, and it is Alice Sweet Alice, directed by Alfred Soule, starring Linda Miller, Paula Shepard, and the young Brooke Shields in her first film role. My connections here were that very distinct sense of place and time. It achieves the same thing on a very low budget. The characters feel very lived in in this, the same way they are very knowable in Black Christmas. There's obviously the Christmas and communion connection of religion and ritual, finding comfort in those things, and that being subverted because it is the story of a young girl who is killed at her first communion and her increasingly strange and withdrawn sister becoming a suspect. There is one of the all-time great cringe-inducing scenes in this where the murderer in this iconic mask and yellow raincoat is stabbing at a woman who is trying to climb the stairs and you see knife go into leg, into foot, in what is somewhat explicit detail, but it's one of those instances where where they are being stabbed seems so painful. For instance, if you see someone get stabbed under the armpit and you think about how much that would hurt, this stabbing straight into the foot affects me the exact same way. I cringe every time I think about it. It is one of the low budget gems of the mid seventies second tier horror films, I would say. Not quite the classic that Black Christmas is, but definitely worth a watch. That's two wonderful recommendations again. Good Neighbors from 2010 and Alice Sweet Alice from 1976. And that brings us to the end of episode 31. Before we get into anything else in our housekeeping section here, we want to say a very special thanks to Jane Sankner for her generous donation this past week. Jane is one of our most faithful listeners, and she sent us a very nice note that said, It's always a pleasure listening to your podcast. It never fails to make me think and smile. Keep up the great work. Thank you very much for that, Jane. Jane totally gets what we're trying to do here. I'm glad that we make her smile. If you would like to be as cool as Jane, although very few people are, you can leave a donation for us via the website, magiclanternpodcast.com, where there is a donation button just down and to the right on the homepage. If you would like to get in touch with us for any other thing, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Facebook and Instagram. You can just search for Magic Lantern Podcast at either one of those places. We are on Twitter at lantern underscore cast. And we have a lot of people to thank for the past couple of weeks, because not only did we have a great response to our episode about the exiles, but it was also International Podcast Day last week, and a ton of people were kind enough to share us with their friends and followers. Buddy Tate, Matteo Boscarol, Grindhouse Dave, Travis Trudell, Tim Lego, Jeff Duncanson, Mark Herney and Aaron West at Criterion Close-Up, 
Leon Huxtable at the Yao Gaday podcast, Daniel Fern at the Loved That Show podcast, Cheryl Jones at the Movies Made Me podcast, Craig Eastman and Scott Morris at Fuds on Film, who just did an excellent episode about 70s horror, probably my favorite time and place in the whole wide world. So if you haven't listened to that yet, go check them out. Mike Palace on the Pod Kiwi, Megan Patton and the folks at the Slash and Burn podcast, and I wanted to say an extra special thanks to Dennis Doros at Milestone Films, who not only shared the link to the prior show, but also sent us a very encouraging note about that episode about the Exiles, a film which they saved from oblivion. So infinite thanks to him for all the work that they do for film lovers everywhere. I also wanted to mention that I was recently on an episode of Plane Cast with our friend Doug McCambridge discussing The Wrestler, which was a really good time. Thanks for having me on, Doug. And last but not least, I wanted to say thanks to Elijah Wood for retweeting Erica's Greasy Strangler picture, which took it from a few hundred views to 40,000 views in a matter of seconds. So countless people saw that disgusting photo of you worldwide. And my cool Greasy Strangler wiener. (laughs) Exactly. You have to see the photo to understand what I'm talking about. We are on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. If you would like to subscribe to, rate, or review the show, that would be fantastic. We are also on Google Play for you Android listeners. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material and that donate button, at the website magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast.